Hi, welcome back. In our last episode of this series, we met Hans-Jürgen Massaqua, an Afro-German grandson of a diplomat whose formative years coincided with Hitler's rise to power. Today, we will take a peek into incidents that served to raise his awareness to the dangers he faced. Hello, good people. My name is Janice, your host here at Dignity, Human Rights in Daily Life. Thank you for stopping by. If you're new here, welcome. After watching this video, I invite you to check out this playlist and please consider subscribing. At age eight, I got my first inkling of the danger the Nazi regime might pose to me. A beautiful spring Sunday started upbeat with a giant paramilitary parade through our neighborhood. Like all the other kids, I had gone to watch the parade and, like everyone else, became caught up in the excitement. As I walked home, I heard loud singing and shouting coming from the building next to ours. My curiosity aroused, I tried to catch a glimpse through the wide open door of the meeting hall. It was packed to overflowing with beer guzzling, smoking, <laughs> shouting, laughing and singing brown shirts. No one seemed to notice me, the living antithesis to their obsession with racial purity as I peered into the meeting hall, or so I thought. Suddenly I felt myself grabbed from behind by two huge fists and lifted into the air. Instinctively, I stretched and bent in rapid succession like a fish on a hook. The next thing I knew, I had slipped from the grip of the two fists and was running as fast as I could to escape my captor. Looking over my shoulder, I caught my first glimpse of my attacker, a huge SA trooper with short cropped white blonde hair and mean little eyes set deep in a ruddy beer flushed face. I might have made good on my escape had it not been for two other brown shirts who, alerted by the shouts of my pursuer, blocked my path. Like a hawk descending on its prey, the SA trooper reclaimed his hapless quarry, and this time none of my kicking, wiggling, and biting could loosen his vise like grip. With superhuman effort, I managed to suppress an instinctive urge to vent my panic by screaming, sensing somehow that I could only expect more abuse. The SA trooper was about to lift me to the speaker's platform when he found himself confronted by an enraged woman who was staring at him with hate-filled eyes. With the fury of a tigress protecting her cubs, Ruchi piled a path through the drunken troopers who were blocking her way until she had reached the speaker's platform and the man who had kidnapped me. Momentarily startled by this trembling yet apparently fearless woman, the giant SA trooper loosened his grip. Heinrich Wieder was a World War I veteran, fanatical Hitler supporter, and German writer. He became headmaster at Kaidnerkampfschule, where Hans attended school. Masakwa recalls, as he paraded in front of us, he suddenly spotted me among the ranks of boys and, like a snake trying to mesmerize its prey, fixed his hateful gaze on me. What I intend to install in this school is pride in being German boys in a national socialist German state, he intoned without taking his eyes off of me. I had grown quite uncomfortable under the principal's stare, but just as I was about to avert my eyes, he moved on, continuing to elaborate on his theme. I couldn't rid myself of the unfamiliar yet unsettling feeling of having just met a personal enemy, someone who wished me ill. It didn't take very long before I found my suspicions confirmed. The first time Vitor gave me tangible evidence of how he felt about me was when he filled in for our sick gym teacher. The principal announced that he would conduct a moot probe, test of courage. He had us build an obstacle course. One gap was so wide that the only way it could be traversed was by jumping into the air and grabbing onto a thick rope that dangled from the ceiling and then, Tarzan-like, swinging to the other side. To add to the difficulty of the maneuver, 
Rita positioned the one boy beside the gap with the instruction to keep the rope in constant motion with the aid of a long stick. I got through the major part of the course quite easily and was headed for the big gap when I saw that Rita himself had taken the place of the boy with the stick. Rather than letting the rope swing to and fro, he held it back in such a way that it remained totally out of my reach. As I waited for him to release the rope, ready to leap as soon as it swung toward me, Rita shouted, Feigling! Coward! Kind moot! No courage! Get out of the way! Not quite believing that he could be so unfair, I waited another moment to see if perhaps he would relent and send the rope my way. But he became only more enraged, shouting at me, Out of the way! Give somebody with courage a chance! Get over there with the other cowards! This example doesn't begin to scratch the surface of the indignities Hans suffered at the hands of Nazi instructors at school. A final example of the racially hostile environment in which he lived occurred at his mother's place of work. Usually my mother came home from work looking cheerful, ready to spend another pleasant evening with me. But one night, instead of greeting me with her customary smile, she seemed on the verge of tears. When I asked her what was wrong, she blurted out the devastating news that she had been fired from her job. She lost her job as a result of a new Nazi policy that barred Jews and other politically unreliable persons from government employment. It wasn't until many years later that Muti told me the real reason for her dismissal, the fact that she had conceived a child by an African. Since my grandfather, a very dark man, had been the dominant figure of my universe, with most whites playing deferential if not subordinate roles, I came to regard a dark complexion and kinky hair as superior attributes and accepted the celebrity treatment accorded me by the public as my well-deserved due. Only after years of maturing and of being rejected, humiliated, and psychologically brutalized was I able to see Hitler himself for what he really was. Instead of putting the blame for my problems with racists where it belonged, I blamed myself. More than anything, I blamed my appearance, especially my African hair, which I had come to loathe. Next week, we'll learn about the black Germans who were exterminated in Hitler's concentration camps. Catch up on the UDHR series here. Learn more about Hans in his book, Destined to Witness, available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble. I will provide non-affiliated links in the description below. Mark hashtag Team Dignity in the comments. Like, share, subscribe if you haven't already. And in the meantime, be well and remember to live your life with dignity. Bye-bye.